have uh, we have a lot of Sri Lankan expatriates living in the United States. We have a lot of Sri Lankan children going to the United States for education. Is there a possibility that uh, our officials can lobby uh, or create a situation where these children could actually go up to higher positions like the uh, Indians did, form our own little uh, unit within the U.S. administration? Well, I think that's a very important question. Um, you know, few people know this. Uh, there are two uh, young diplomats in the United States, um, both of Sri Lankan origin, uh, the, uh, the Amitra Nayagans. Um, they're, they're American diplomats. I, uh, from the writings of one of them, because he publishes in Ground Views, he's also a U.S. diplomat. Uh, they're not very friendly currently towards uh, Sri Lanka. But th their father, Gaya Mitra was Sri Lanka's Deputy High Commissioner in London. He taught, I mean, he and, and my father were classmates, so they were friends. He taught English literature at the University of Hawaii, which is where... Uh, the the youngsters, his sons, and young Barack Obama got to know each other. So you made the connection. I could see that. Yes. Now, uh, so there there are Sri Lankans moving up. Not all of them are sympathetic, but there are plenty of other Sri Lankans. There are tens of thousands of young Sri Lankans. Uh, in the universities, who have graduated from universities in the United States. And who are naturalized citizens and, of the U.S. And, right and who live in the United States. Now, you hear this story about how difficult it is to break through to the U.S. media, how the Elam lobbies have paid money, uh, you know, how difficult, you know, like this is impossible. It's not impossible. Why is it, impo why, why is it impossible? Because we haven't done the obvious thing. And the obvious thing is what you're talking about. We have to reach out to our own youngsters, and I don't mean only Sinhalese, but of course also Everyone. Sinhalese, Tamils, Muslims, Malays, Burgers, who are not hardcore anti-Sri Lankan elements. Uh, and there are tens of thousands. Many of them, or quite a few really, have studied in elite Ivy League U.S. universities. Uh, there are m several hundred, maybe more, who are academics in the United States. Uh, some of them are very senior, I and mean, they, they left when they were adults, uh, like uh, Professor Garanath Obasekara, Professor H. L. Sagnarath, and some of them are quite young, in, including uh, one of my students at Columbia University, who is now a, uh, a, a young assistant professor somewhere in New York, Harinder Vidhanagi. So, I mean, uh, there are people who have gone from here, and there are people who have been born and grown up there. Now, those are the people, that's the army that the Sri Lankan side has to leverage. Um, and you can't leave it entirely to the embassy. The embassy is important, but the Tamil Elam network doesn't have an embassy. These are civil society activists. They've been able to uh, leverage, to motivate and leverage um, young people, educated youngsters. To their cause. Uh, but the Sri Lankan side has been unable to know why is that. I would say the reason is, and uh, now I mean sort of very telegraphic, I'm, I'm summarizing it, uh, it's a little caricatured, but still. What are you talking about, Ramesh, is the, is the Obama generation of Sri Lankans. Uh, these are smart kids. Uh, they're liberal. Uh, they are pluralist, they are multicultural. Um, there is a huge disconnect between, on this side, the style, the rhetoric, the profile uh, that the Sri Lankan state projects, including through its embassies all over the world, uh, and the activist or so-called patriotic uh, Sri Lankan expat networks which are connected to the embassies and to Colombo. This is on, on the one hand. And the young uh, Obama generation Sri Lankans. Because these guys, uh, the, 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 the Sri Lankan representatives, the officials, the way they speak, what they say, their message. This is George W. Bush rhetoric. I mean, these guys are neocons. 
uh, I know I worked with uh, I, I was never one of them but I worked with the state I worked within the state mm -hmm. uh, of course I, I just kept all these expat groups away and worked with the young people with young people in, in uh, Geneva and in France that young interns who were from Cambridge Sri Lankans they volunteered uh, who studied in the United States uh, who uh, we recruited people who studied at the Sorbonne at Sciences Po kids in their 20s but in general, and that was an exception, in general, they stay away from uh, the whole uh, Sri Lankan uh, embassy and hardline patriotic networks because these guys are so George Bush Tea Party movement types, while these youngsters have a different mindset. Now, the American media is liberal, more or less. Uh, you can it is these youngsters who are Americans of Sri Lankan origin, second generation diaspora, who can write to the newspapers, uh, who can appear on television, who can appear on radio talk shows, if they are so motivated. There are Sri Lankans who are not necessarily second generation expats, who are celebrated in the US media. The New York Times uh, list of top books for the last year, 2013, listed in its top 10, uh, a book by a, a well-known young Sri Lankan authoress who suffered a terrible tragedy during the tsunami, Sonali Daranegal. I mean, I used to know her, you know, they were among the young students we knew way back in the 80s when she was studying in England. Now, Sonali's book, Wave, is on the top 10 list of the New York Times uh, review of books. Now, can we, is the government capable of reaching out to her? Uh, motivating her to write something which is not propaganda but which is a more balanced and truthful account of what's going on in Sri Lanka to the American press if that can be done the New York Times is not going to refuse a piece by Sonali but that is not the wavelength that the Sri Lankan state is on oh, right. currently and that is why there is this big gulf there's a whole army out there which can be motivated and mobilized, but it would take a Lakshman Kadargama uh, to do it, and we, we don't have that kind of. Let's, let's talk locally. Do you believe that Sri Lanka is creating the next wave of Sri Lankan diplomats here in our own country to take up the reins after the old guard leaves office? Do you believe that we are making the preparations for it? Uh, I, I am not convinced that that is the case. There are some very bright young people, uh, not only in the Ministry of External Affairs, but also in the Ministry of Trade. Uh, I'm, I, I work with them. There are some uh, bright, uh, very bright people in the Sri Lankan military as well. But uh, no, I, I don't think that uh, we are gearing for the war that we are now fighting, which is the Cold War. And, and there are so many countries, small countries, uh, which have done so well in this. Uh, the Cubans are a very good example. Those diplomats are brilliant. I mean, these are young people, uh, very uh, motivated, but very smart, very, uh, very professional, uh, fine, fine young diplomats. Uh, the Pakistanis have good diplomats. Oh, no, we don't, because the criteria here uh, is not merit, and it has not been merit for a very long time. Now, by merit, I don't mean necessarily that only Ministry of External Affairs, so-called professional diplomats have to move up, because some of the best diplomats we had, including in the United States, uh, were from outside the foreign ministry, such as uh, Ambassador Neville Kanakaratna, Ambassador Shirley Amar Singh, a legendary in New York. Uh, but I do believe that when you're fighting a very serious Cold War, you cannot afford to do anything but have merit, i.e. ability, as the criterion. Uh, but I, I don't think that's been done. In fact, I think we're doing exactly the opposite. And uh, that's not the way in which you, you fight a war against very serious uh, challenges. I wouldn't say enemies. I don't think the United States is an enemy of Sri Lanka. I don't think Britain is an enemy of Sri Lanka. But those two uh, foreign ministries well, and our others are... Uh, now working on the Sri Lankan case yes. uh, and I don't know whether we have mobilized the best uh, available talent within Sri Lanka and even within the government even within the cabinet 
uh, to face this this challenge. But uh, let me come back to Ambassador Stephen J. Rapp, uh, the uh, Ambassador Large uh, on, on war crimes was here. Now, Stephen J. Rapp was earlier one of the chief prosecutors. There were three successive chief prosecutors in the International Criminal Court's proceedings against uh, Charles Taylor, President of Liberia. Liberia. So that's his background. He's a prosecutor in the International Criminal, Criminal Court. Court. Now, Stephen Rapp took over from another chief prosecutor who was a Sri Lankan. Sir Desmond De Silva QC, one of the sons of the legendary Fred De Silva, who was mayor of Candy. Uh, he has a very prestigious law firm in London. And he was the chief prosecutor before Ambassador Rapp took over as chief prosecutor. Now, surely the government of Sri Lanka should consult Sir Desmond De Silva QC on the challenge we are facing in Geneva. On, on issues of accountability and international law. I don't think it has done so. But I do know that the, that the government did consult Sir Desmond De Silva QC on something else a couple of years ago. And that was on the hedging deal that uh, one of our ministries Minister or said, whatever yes. got involved in. So when it comes to hedging and money and officials and so on, we consult the best Sri Lankans that there are. But when it comes to something to do with our sovereignty, something that's far more important than a hedging deal. We do not consult the person who was the predecessor of Ambassador Stephen J. Rapp, the war crimes ambassador, at the International Criminal Court uh, uh, presiding over the, uh, in, in, the, in the trial against uh, Charles Taylor. So there is a strange illogic uh, in the way in which uh, we function despite the very serious international challenge we are facing, Ramesh. Dr. Jan, uh, we will go in for a short commercial break, but on the other side, we'll have more on the United Nations Human Rights Council issue, the vote that is coming up. Mm -hmm.